So thank you very much, Jack, um, for putting that on. We are, we've got a few more people joining us and we do thank everyone for joining us again for our FTMA Australia webinar. Um, that's Understanding Timber Durability and Protection with um, Jack Norton from the Timber Preservation Association of Australia. Um, we welcome you all on board. We especially give a, um, a welcome to MGA TMA, Timber Trade Industrial Association, and any TABMAR members that have joined us um, as we've opened up the webinars to them because we think the topics for October are so important that we should share with the whole of industry. Just to let everyone know um, our upcoming webinars, next week we have the Chain of Custody Program for Fabricators with Dave Gover from the Engineered Wood Products um, Association of Australasia. On the 21st of October, we have Understanding the Sawn Timber Market with Tim Woods of Industry Edge. At the moment, FTMA Australia has sent out a 2020 Fabricators Survey and part of the information in that survey is actually going to be given in aggregated format to Tim for him to present back to us on the 21st of October. 28th of October is, is your Timber Fit for Purpose with Andy McNaught from EWPAA as well. And then from the 4th of November to the 9th of December, it's only for FTMA Australia members and we have um, the six weeks of Christmas. Um, during that period, we'll be giving away over $6,000 in prizes, um, special weekly draws for members um, that will get surprises from FTMA and one lucky Victorian plant has me come out and cook for them for Christmas lunch for their crew. But if it's a big plant, it's only morning tea. Um, our past webinars, we've had some great webinars and we've had a lot of people contact us about accessing them. They're all on our website um, with the exception of last week's top 100 which is, um, builders, which is on the FTMA members only um, page. But otherwise, all our resources and all the webinars we've been ha um, held so far are on the website. And I definitely urge people to um, go and look, check them out. So today, back in August 2019, we, as certifiers, um, started, I suppose, asking for more information. We had a fabricator in Queensland who was having a huge issue with um, compliance and getting the certifier to accept the compliance information. Now, we all know that fabricators Usually, usually use a timber from one up to four or five timber suppliers. And so it was really important that we found a way with Timber Queensland, Engineered Wood Products Association of Australasia and the Timber Preservation Association of Australia that we could find some easier formats and help fabricators better understand it. So Jack, I'm just gonna stop sharing here. And if you unmute and you can go back and share yours and we can start. So you're still on mute, Jack. Nikita, he can't get the mute. Jack, still on mute down in the bottom left-hand corner. Unmute yourself. There you right. are. Yeah. Right. Why is that under you? I don't know. It should be under my under Everything's my. Everything's under me. <laughs> Of course. So you me. can start to share your screen. All right. Does everyone see that? Not yet, no. Okay. Share, share, share. Just a minute. That's share. Right. Share screen. Try that. Share. Now, F5. Wait a minute. I'll get this. I'll get this right. Right. Beautiful. Can you see me now? Yep. Are we good? Yep. Are we good? All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Kirsten, for asking me to do this. Um, those of you who know me know that I'm as old as dirt. I've been around this industry for an awful long time. Um, most of my career was with the Queensland Forest Service or Department or DD or DAF or whatever bloody organisations it's morphed into. Um, but it was basically the same job. It was all involved with. Um, wood protection and some would say 42 years in wood protection is pretty sad but anyway that's what it is um, I just can't get away from it okay um, I think the take-home lesson from this home present this presentation is that there is a lot of information out there and if you have any questions all you have to do is ask we'll try and help our aim in life 
or oh, actually the TPA, one of TPAA's aims is to help you guys make as much profit as you can by using the product that we all produce or treated timber is produced. Starting on the actual presentation, one of the things that's quirky about Australia is that we're a bloody big organized country, bloody big country, and we have lots and lots of different applications where we use timber. Um, we go from snow country, tropical rainforest, dry central Queensland, um, and, and the coastal areas. So a huge area where we use wood. Just by way of comparison, I often get the comment, oh, we don't do it like that in England. We don't do it like that in Europe. It's, uh, but you know, the, our, our climatic conditions are huge and varied. And we've got one set of specifications for the whole, that apply to the whole country. I'll address this later on as we go. So we're a big country, we use timber throughout the country and there are lots and lots of different applications. Now we're not strangers to using wood. This is a classic Queensland style house. The reason I know this house is because it's my place. And you can see there, we use different timbers from different places and different applications and it, it's just, you know, we use wood quite a bit. Nowadays, we tend to use brick a lot more, and a lot of the stuff that we've got is pine framing, and, I'll, and I'm, I'm sure you're interested in that, but we'll talk about that a bit later. When we talk about wood preservation in Australia, wood protection, wood preservation, we are not talking about protection from chemicals. Wood preservation, there are no rules around protecting it from chemicals. We don't protect it from fire which is really interesting given the, the evolving, developing bushfire um, codes. Um, I think, I personally believe we should, um, but at this stage, as far as I'm aware, that there's no move towards including fire protection as a treatment on wood. Maybe that'll change in the future. We're not talking about weathering. Wood preservation does not protect weathering against weathering. Uh, all wood will go a silver gray type color exposed to the sun. And obviously the extent of weathering depends on the amount of exposure that it gets. We're not talking about painting. Painting is not wood preservation. Painting is cosmetic. Um, now, the, uh, just this morning, I, I happened to be talking to, to some researchers this morning that we should be doing trials I don't know about the rest of Australia, but I know in Queensland, all the builders paint the end grain before they put, you know, put timber together with an undercoat. Well, not all, but by far the most of them. Uh, timber that's exposed to the weather. So they think they're protecting the wood. I don't know. I really don't know. But we officially, we don't regard painting as a preservative treatment. And probably the biggest problem that we've got is that the timber is not used properly. Now, you, this photograph that I just showed you is before Photoshop days. This is a real photograph. And obviously someone's been seriously pissed off by the person in that house. When we talk about wood preservation in Australia, we're talking about decay. Now, some people might call it dry rot, but for decay to occur, the timber has to have moisture uh, present usually more than about 20% moisture. And that usually occurs when poor building practice causes moisture to be trapped. We're talking about insect protection. This is usually um, internal products, furniture, uh, lining, wall lining inside, um, trim, uh, and that sort of stuff. Termites, you're all familiar with, and we'll talk more about um, termite protection later on. Um, and then there's marine borers, right? That's generally what we're talking about when we're talking about wood preservation uh, in this country. Now you can control those hazards by a number of different ways. You can control decay and termites, for example, with proper design and detailing. A lot of the problems that you may encounter with wood preservation is the stuff is used poorly. The, the design is poor, it traps water. Water wicks into the timber and creates a higher hazard than what it's protected for. Natural resistance. You'll be familiar with natural resistance. If I say to you, if I put a piece of radiata pine in the ground or a piece of iron bark in the ground, which one's gonna last longer? 
okay, the iron bark is going to last longer, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Preservative treatment, we can apply wood preservative chemicals. Now, these things are called biocides. Biocide, they kill things. They are wood preservatives. They are there to stop decay and insects. Now, people get all jittery about the use of chemicals. I'll talk about that later. If we're talking about trees, trees are basically triangular in shape, as you can see from that diagram. Trees grow outwards. They grow in this direction here. There is a growth um, uh, membrane just under the bark here, or just under the bark there, sorry. Um, the best analogy I can give is if you peel the skin off an onion, you'll see this slimy skin just under the hard outer crust. That's where the growth process is taking place. So we've got carbon dioxide and sunlight, um, or carbon dioxide trapped in the leaves and sunlight being captured by the leaves and it's being taken down the tree to the growth site. From the root system, we get water and um, uh, food and it's carried up to the growth site. So it's carried up and then it's carried outwards. All right, so we've got pipes that go up and down the stem and we've got pipes that go in and out of the stem. Now, the reason I'm rabbiting on about this is we use the same pipework to get wood preservatives into the wood, all right? Now, as the tree goes up higher, to stop it from flopping around, the pipes on the middle are filled with waxes and resins, and that gives the timber its durability, its res natural resistance. So on the outside, we've got empty pipes and on the inside we've got filled pipes those filled pipes give it give the tree stiffness and um, as i said before these pipes on the outside we use to carry the wood preserved into it so we've got two zones we've got the zone in the middle and we've got the zone on the outside so for a eucalypt for example this zone or in both conifers and eucalypts, this inner zone is called the heartwood. This is where the pipework is filled with, with uh, waxes and resins. Here on the outside, the pipework is empty. Same as here on a conifer, um, the pipework here in the sapwood is empty and pipework here is full. So you'll notice as we turn this round thing into rectangular, rectangular things, we get different layouts of sapwood and heartwood so if you go down to your local bunnings store um, you will see on the landscape sleepers for example formations that might look like this this is the bit that is protected by wood preservative on those sleepers this bit is not protected by wood preservative um, and it relies on its natural resistance to decay all right so in Australia, the natural heartwood decay resistance has been put into four classifications. For above ground, for in ground, sorry, you expect more than 25 years life. For above ground, you expect more than 40 years life. So you've got going from high durability to low durability. And you can see there, this is the expected life expectancy in these, this application. Now, engineers get all terribly excited about this kind of information because that gives them a level of predictability on how long a piece of wood will perform. But then, you know, there, there are issues with that. Okay, so we've got this natural durability of the heartwood. Notice that the sapwood, I'm not talking about the sapwood, this is heartwood durability. The sapwood is considered to be not durable. In terms of uh, uh, resistance to termites and insects, it's either resistant or it's non-resistant. Would you believe, and this is true as I'm sitting here, that the heartwood of slash and carabia pines is resistant to termite attack, whereas the heartwood of radiata pine is subject to termite attack? Pines do not get tend not to get attacked by the same insects that attack our hardwoods. And all this stuff is listed out in this national standard. You as users are not expected to know this off by heart. Um, and I guess in general, you only use one or two species anyway. 
Compared to the rest of the world, the standout feature is that look at the life expectancy in Australia compared to the other areas. The POMs are very similar to us, but they're no longer in the EU now, so it doesn't matter. Um, and um, but look at the look at the how long it lasts. Like for example, in Brazil, they're high durability species; they can expect to last eight years. So we expect a lot more out of our wood than many other jurisdictions, uh, and the Yanks are all over the place. So uh, that's how long it lasts in ground. Now. If you think about it logically, wood is going to be used inside, outside above ground and ground contact and marine. So there are really four areas where you're likely to use wood. Um, now, during part of the standards negotiation process, and those of you who have been involved in standards negotiation understand that it's give or take. You've, you've got a bargain, you've got a haggle, as Monty Python would say. So, and that's what we did. So now we've got two hazard classifications inside. The H1 to protect against insects, H2 to protect against termites. You can read that there. The unfortunate thing, and there's no going back on this, is unlike the durability classification, H1 is the lowest and H6 is the hardest. So you, as you go up this hazard class, you put more preservative in to protect it because there it's harder to protect as you go up this environment. With the natural durability, H1 hardwoods, or sorry, uh, class one hardwoods were the most durable. So it's reversed. It's unfortunate, but there's no way we're gonna change that now. Um, so you've got a natural progression inside, outside, above ground, ground contact. This was negotiation as well. Uh, in the early days in Queensland, we used to have only one ground contact hazard class and marine. Okay, just because I like messing with people's minds, um, back in 1987, when the hazard classification was first developed, um, those, those six hazard classes were pretty straightforward. But as time evolved, we started getting separation or, or subdivision of the various hazard classes. So. If your wood is treated to H2, it's okay anywhere in Australia to protect it against termites. If your wood is treated to H2F, this applies to envelope treated framing only, and it can only be used south of the Tropic of Capricorn. All right, so H2F, envelope treated only, this includes roof trusses and house framing, um, and it's only south of the Tropic of Capricorn. H2S, right, is a different set of specifications, and that also can be used south of the Tropic of Capricorn. The reason is there's this great big beautiful wall that runs across with the Tropic of Capricorn, and the giant termite in North Queensland does not come south of that wall. We've managed to do what Trump can't do, and we've stopped the termites coming south. Um, so, uh, but we've got climate change, so who knows what's gonna happen next. But anyway, H2F, about about Rockhampton, south of Rockhampton, we don't get those uh, giant termites. And these are seriously aggressive beasts, the, the master termites in North Queensland and Northern Western Australia and Darwin, uh, Northern Territory. Okay, so we can put less in. Now, as I said before, as you go up this hazard class, you put more preservative into the wood. Each one of these hazard classes has a set of specifications for concentration and penetration of wood preservative. That, that, that has been shown to work by the supply of data. The people doing the application supply data to show that a certain concentration of preservative and a certain penetration of preservative will perform in this, say for example, this H3 application. Now you've got different, like engineered wood products are, are a different beast altogether. The current national standard is in five parts, five separate parts. The new draft standard has the whole five parts mushed into one big document. Not really different, just a different format. There are some changes around the edges, but you've still got the hazard classification system. You've still got penetration and retention specifications, and it's all, it's all there. Okay. These are the wood preservatives currently approved for use in Australia. 
not your problem. This is my problem, or this is a researcher's problem. But you can see here, for example, that CCA, copper chrome arsenate, can do the lot, can do them all. Whereas um, 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 propiconazole, tebuconazole, the current LOSP formulation, will only do H3. You can't put use um, teb and pro uh, LOSP in ground contact, for example. Tributyl tin compounds, they're there for history. They tend not to be used these days. Um, we've got three plants listed with the Timber Preservers Association as using TBT. I think two of those are kiwi plants. I think they might still be using them, but I'm not sure. All right, so they're all approved. All those preservatives there are approved. When we're talking about branding, okay, the one of the requirements of the standard, the Australian standard on wood preservation, is that it will be marked in a certain way. The, this is the current way, this is the current information that's got to be included in a brand. Um, the new standard um, refers to um, this here as a, a it says a unique brand, it doesn't have to be a number. People like Hein and Son, for example, put their company name on the wood rather than a particular preservative number. So every treatment plant in Australia um, is, has got a preservative number, and that's a list that is held by the TPAA, the Timber Preservers Association. This list was originally maintained by State Forests of New South Wales um, under the Timber Marketing Act. Now, when the Timber Marketing Act was shut down, the TPAA took over the task of maintaining the list. These preservatives are currently listed in the current standard, part one, and they are generically listed in, in the new standard. It tells you what the preservatives are, what it's being treated with. And that obviously is the hazard class, the level of protection that that piece of wood has been uh, treated to. Now, this information is on our website. You can get this information off our website, tpaa.com.au. This information is a claim by the producer that that piece of wood meet, meets a certain requirement. It's a claim. And this is sort of what you get to see out in the big bad world. You get the preservative number, uh, sorry, the, the treatment plant number, the preservative and the hazard class, as you can see there. The, now, under the national standard, every piece of wood over 16 millimetres thick um, and fifth, uh, an area of 1,500 square millimetres must carry identification. Uh, stuff narrower than that, things like fence palings or um, in uh, moulding, you can pack brand. All right, so every piece, of, if you are claiming compliance with the standard, then you've got to, be, got to carry a brand, an indication, tell you what you can use for. Now, the branding. All right. Um, you can see there, you can re read that information, obviously. It's a claim. It's really important from a chain of custody point of view, the branding. If things go along okay, you don't care. It's not really important for you as a user to know who produced it. The only time that becomes important is if it fails in the marketplace. All right. Now I'll talk a little bit more about this, I think, in the next slide. So this just this helps you pin back where the actual treated product was, was produced. Now, um, I'll, I've got some more information later on, obviously. This here, the preservative used, you don't really care what it's treated with. You really, you're really worried about this, the hazard class. You don't care. The reason that is there is if we have to test compliance, with all those preservatives um, that um, I listed in a previous slide, it would cost an awful lot of money to do all those analysis. We're not like CSI on the TV where we can do magical things in an instance. You need a sizable sample of wood to be analyzed. It doesn't happen overnight. You're probably looking at about five days. Um, and um, yeah, it, the, by knowing what to analyze for, we don't have to analyze for the whole lot. So if for example, O2, I know is CCA. I think 64 is Teb Probe. I'm not sure about that. 
but it tells the chemist what to analyze for. As I said here, you don't really care. This here, this is important because it tells you where you can use the product. Um, and it's also, you, well, it tells you what to test the product to. But this is the bit that you're really interested in. One of my favorite stories is I was in um, Bunnings um, uh, buying some bits of wood and this tradie type dude um, uh, with a yellow shirt and their work boots was asking the guy behind the Bunnings counter, what was the difference between H4 or H3 and H4? And I was ready to rip in and just give him the whole textbook answer. And the Bunnings guy gave a textbook answer, gave it exactly as it should be. And then the tradie said, well, which one's cheaper? So that's what we're up against. You need people to know what this is, where it can be used. The issues, issues. Now there are problems with branding, uh, particularly truss and frame manufacturers. One of the first things you're gonna do is cut up your bit of wood and the brand is usually gone. You usually cut the brand off. Strictly speaking, according to the letter of the law, if that piece of wood is not branded, you cannot claim compliance with the standard. That brand is a claim that it complies with the standard. As I say there, it's a real, real problem for, you, for the trust and frame manufacturers because firstly, you get your product from, as um, Kirsten said, you get your product from a number of different suppliers and secondly, you cut it up. So what are you gonna do about branding then? I'll talk about that in a second. Large manufacturers such as Hein, such as AKD, have their own treatment plants. So they can afford to brand a piece of wood along the length of a piece of wood. They can afford to do that because it's a, a simple inking process in the um, production, a, an ink stamp in the production process or some, some system. The problem is that we, there are the, the, big, the big players, there's probably about three, maybe four or five, or a couple of small ones, but not so big, that can do the branding along the length. Most treaters are custom treaters. That means they get a pack of wood coming through the front gate um, and all they can get access to is the ends of the piece. The only way they're going to brand along the piece is, if to, is to pull it apart, brand it and repack it and you're not gonna pay for that. So the only thing they can do is brand it on the ends. Um, now there's also an issue with um, um, uh, engineered wood products. You know, you, you tr they treat in great long lengths and they're not usually supplied in great long lengths. They, um, they treat for stock um, and um, an order comes in, a bit goes out and gets treated and gets cut up, da 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 da. So you've got a real issue with branding of long bits of wood and branding done by custom treaters. Now the timber could, is most likely to be properly treated when it leaves the treatment plant. I would suggest that the majority of cases, the product is, adequate, is treated properly according to the standard. The problem is when it gets cut up because particularly with engineered wood products, you've got en uh, envelope specifications and cutting up a long piece of uh, LBL, for example, or a glue lamb beam could expose unpenetrated wood. What are you gonna do about it? Now, look, I'm a public servant from way back. And I, I believe, I, records, 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 records. That's the only thing that can be done about it, is you keep records of everything. It's a pain, but in the, this electronic era, it's a lot easier. You keep copies of everything, delivery dockets, invoices, and link them to a job. So when, when product fails in the marketplace and they come looking for blood, you've got something to show that you've done the right thing. Uh, oh yeah, FTMA have, as Kirsten uh, referred to before, have developed a um, uh, a, uh, a paperwork, if you will, to that you can co to, to you can show compliance with. You got documentation like this. I urge you to fill it out. I urge you to complete it um, or, or, and use it. So either that one, north of the tropic or south of the tropic, different, slightly different forms but you can see there, it's just a statement that it complies. Now, when you buy or receive treated timber, if it is, when you're receiving it, right? So when it's coming into your plant, if it's not branded, you cannot assume that it has been preserved or treated to the standard. 
regardless of other forms of certification. That's when you buy it. All right. If it fails at some time in the future, you've got no comeback. And as I said to you guys before, it's highly recommended that all brands are retained. All right. Now this is doable. It's very doable, particularly with, with camera, camera recording. In Australia, the currently approved preservatives are approved by the, the federal, this federal agency, these guys, these guys here. All right. You've got to prove that the product works, it's assessed, and if it, if it works as claimed, then you get yourself a label. Now, these guys are proved not only does it work, but is it safe to use? Um, does it impact on the environment? Um, and, and a number of other specifications. All right, so this is for all agricultural chemicals and wood preservatives are deemed to be an agricultural chemical. And the label on the, on the wood preservative tells you how it may be used. The wood preservatives that timber is treated with, you cannot buy in the open marketplace. You've got to buy them from chemical suppliers. They are not allowed to sell it uh, according to the label specification. They are not allowed to sell it to Joe Citizen or Bob the Builder. Unfortunately, this lot approves chemicals for use in Australia but only if it protects against um, insects, termites, decay, or whatever. The reason I say unfortunately is because um, it could be a propeller. It could be twisted and warped, doesn't matter. It's approved by these guys and it's a perfectly well-protected preservative piece of wood. It's just not fit for purpose. Um, it doesn't tell you how, how long the product will last, which I find really interesting. Um, it doesn't approve that. And uh, in terms of life cycle for the, uh, for the treated product, uh, you've got to rely on the natural durability and a lot of work that's been done by CSIRO. In the good old days, um, we used to have these specifications. All right, we used to have it in Queensland, used to have it in New South Wales. These dates are getting on a bit, so I should stop rabbiting on about it. But, um, you know, they were good days. We used to be considered to be mongrels for going around treating plants, checking a treated product but it stopped a lot of poor product entering the marketplace. The specifications were basically the same. We talked to each other. In Australia, we've got about 120 treatment plants, about 100 um, approved from outside Australia. Um, so we've got a lot of timber coming into the country. There are no laws that currently control the sale of preservative treated wood. Um, it, there is nothing like the Queensland and New South Wales Act used to control this. They don't control it anymore. It's buyer beware. Unless, there, unless, the, um, unless it's required by the specifier, like if you're a trust manufacturer, unless you require it, there is no requirement to check the quality. Large corporates do have their own because they're seen as, as de having deeper pockets. They have their own in-house quality systems and there are other private quality people out there available. Some treatment plants do use quality schemes, others do not. There's a frightful lack of knowledge about the use of treated timber in Australia. It is really scary. Unfortunately, it's very expensive to try and teach people how to use timber properly. Um, there's a lot, lot of concern out there. Um, timber is this is not quite true, I think, these days. I think timber is getting its environmental credentials. Um, it, um, it is seen as a product that is, that is environmentally, or it is in, it's growing in reputation as a product that's environmentally friendly. The problem is, one of the biggest problems, and I think I'll refer to it later on, is that there are so many treatment plants on so many are sawmills in Australia that it's hard to speak with one voice. Now, a lot of people are frightened with chemicals. If someone tells you that a particular chemical is bad and in the same breath doesn't tell you what dose of that chemical is bad, they are either ignorant or they're trying, they're deliberately trying to mislead you. Or the chemical that has killed most people in the world is water, um, yet we're not worried about that. If you walk barefoot on bitumen, you walk across cancer-forming compounds like you wouldn't believe. Chemicals are perfectly safe to use provided that they are there in the right dose. The amount of chemical in a 
piece of treated wood, um, you like the worst one, worst inverted commas is CCA, you'd have to be eat about half a cubic foot of wood to get a dose. We cannot take arsenic out of your diet, otherwise your hair would fall out. All right, so it's all about dose. And I rabbit on about this continuously. I get, I feel lots of phone calls about it continuously. Wood pres preservative treated chemical, uh, sorry, preservative treated wood is just as safe to use as untreated wood. And you should take exactly the same precautions for both. Um, the, well, when I, when I first did this, um, uh, yeah, sorry, I mentioned, I, I referred to this earlier. There are, it's all over the country, all over the country, from way up in North, Northern Australia, right down South. And there's three large corporates. Um, the large, the Bunnings of the world do squeeze prices. Um, that's part of their, their, um, their process. I mean, you know, their, their, their responsibility is to return shareholder money. And that's part of the deal It's getting the best price for their products. And they can squeeze quality and rules. There's no point in having rules if you don't monitor it. There, TPAA is agitating very, very strongly to get a national quality scheme in place. Um, those of you who know me know that I have been going on about this since the word dot, since the year dot. Um, it's a tough road. It's a tough road getting a national quality scheme in place. Okay. We can improve, as I say, we can have a national quality. How come the concrete has to have it and we don't? User education, we could improve on that, certainly could. Um, you just compare the amount of time in tertiary institutions put, um, put into you, how to use wood compared to how to use steel and concrete, and they don't compare. This is something we could certainly work with, and I'll talk about this in a second, or in, in the next slide. Um, I, I've got L joints, or I had L joints, uh, which are a particular form of timber exposure in Alice Springs, not Alice Springs, in, in Mount Isa. There are a radiata pine heartwood, which was there after 22 years. And I lost the same thing uh, at Innisfail in about nine months to decay. So there is an opportunity to target um, geographic locations with different levels of treatment. Now, um, we can also treat different products. For example, fence palings. Do they have to be completely penetrated by wood preservative? Um, you know, there are decking. Do we have to? I don't know. I don't know. At the moment, you're required to have all sapwood penetration plus a hardwood limitation. Um, maybe there are different penetration patterns that are that that are worth pursuing. Glue laminated timber. It's a world of pain to treat. Um, both in LVL and glue lamb timber, the glue line stops preservative penetration. So it's a lot harder to treat. And um, once you cut any protective envelope, um, then you're in, into, into problems. I've seen, I've been called out to inspect um, uh, joists and bearers that were glue lamb that went right through the house, went out to a deck and they virtually, the, the deck timbers uh, rotted and they virtually had to pull the house apart to replace it. Targeting end use, are there some apps out there that you may be interested in? This is, um, these are free, they're available. Q Timber is something that, that applies to Queensland only and we are, um, there is a move in the industry to try and get this across um, the whole of the country. It tells you which timber to use where and I'll give you more about it in the next, in the next couple of slides. This also, Construction Timbers in Queensland is the paper version of that. Now, Honestly, people, I prefer paper versions because I like to see the see the whole picture. I like to see where it sits. I have, yeah, but anyway, that's me. Um, so you can get this. Now you can get them. Q Timber is free off the web and Construction Timbers in Queensland is off our website. There's a tpaa.com website. You can get it off there and, and, and that's free to download. Um, there's that many species they talk about. And what, what Q Timber and Construction Timbers in Queensland does, and we're talking about geographic location, is you can see four different hazard zones, all right? Four different zones where you can use wood. Now, these are based on shire boundaries. This is for in-ground. There's a similar one for above ground. And what it does is, for example, if you take Aracoon, um, in-ground zone C, da-da-da-da-da, you know, it tells you what those zones are. All right, and 
you can see here that gray gum in um, above ground zone A, you can use it. Whereas in ground zone A, you've got to use something else. They're, they're all messages. So that detail is out there. So specifiers and engineers can go into this stuff and they can get information out there. Now this is freely available information. And I would suggest to you that the stuff that applies in Queensland would largely apply across the country. New and alternative systems, natural wood preservatives. If they were good, we'd be using them. Over the years, I've been around, I'll say I've been around for a long time and people have used lots and lots and lots of natural wood preservatives or tried to get them in place. If they were cost effective and if they worked, we'd be using them and they're not. Heat treatment. Euros love it because it doesn't involve nasty chemicals. Refer back to my talk about chemicals before. As I say, the Euros love it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the thing is, I use heat treated wood as termite bait. Uh, heat treated wood is not resistant to termites, and in fact, I reckon it attracts them. Wood plastic composite, good stuff. It is good stuff. That's major, major competition, costs a lot more than treated wood. Um, uh, but people still buy it. So there's a, there's a perception that it, it's reliable and it will last. Critical fluid treatments, that's where it's liquid CO2, liquid carbon dioxide. There's one plant in the world in Denmark. Um, there, we're trying to get a plant in Australia, but the capital costs are horrendous getting it in there. It, the preservative is dissolved in CO2 and it's, um, the CO2 is recycled and captured. Modified wood, that's where you impregnate a resin um, into the wood. Um, yeah, it works. Um, there's some of it in Australia, but you don't, you know, it, it really hasn't taken hold. Again, the Euros love it. And that, I think, is it. Uh, thank you very much. Kirsten, um, uh, back to you for questions, I guess, if anyone's got questions. We do. If you can just stop sharing your screen for a moment, Jack, that would be great. Very much. Um, we've got a few questions here. Um, Nick yep. Lovanas, um made a comment more that um, internal and externally fire rated timber is available in Australia and there is a bushfire rated decking and other products being sold right now. Um, a comment there. Um, Brett Bolden wanted to know, is, isn't LOSP normally H2 and H3 treatment? Yes. Yes. So what the, yes, yes it is. LOSP is H3. Um, you can treat eucalypts with um, LOSP to protect against insects. It has, it is approved, I think, um, and you can do it. But it, the, by far the majority of it is H2 and H3. Okay. Um, we've got one here that says for sleep applications in southern states, one assumes using H4 treated radiator pine is being used. With deeper sleepers, they obviously have a lot of heart in wood. If um, if it's if it is difficult to treat the heartwood, then are they fit for purpose? Right. This was a major fight during the development of the standard. A it was a big punch up. Um, it was something that New South Wales insisted on because they had lots and lots of radiata pine. You can penetrate the heartwood of some radiata pine. Apparently, it depends on where you get the radiata pine from. Um, but at, at a practical level, stuff going into a custom treater could come from anywhere. And if it is, um, if it does have lots of unpenetrated hardwood, then it is not fit for purpose and you may get five to eight years out of it. And that's it. Okay. We've got another one here saying, what does industry need to do with treated timber waste or treated timber products at the end of life, circular economy? CCA is obviously seen as an issue, but how about lower toxic toxicity H2 treatments or H3 LOSP or other copper preservatives? Can we recycle some of these waste treated products or burn them as cogeneration fuel to produce energy, displacing non-renewable fossil fuels? Right. Uh, <laughs> what a great question, as they it's say. A huge issue, um, yes. Yeah, I, I'm not going to chuck this over to Nick to answer. <laughs> um, the... Um, Look, it's a problem. There's no doubt. It is a problem. Um, the, um, 
various state government agencies have their own way of, of dealing with it. I know for sure that um, in Queensland, you can compost ACQ treated timber, and I'm pretty sure you can compost um, LOSP treated timber. Um, unfortunately, it's not big enough a problem for people to put, um, to, 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 for legislation to, to deal with adequately yet. I believe it will become a problem. Uh, I know Jeff Morell at the Durability Centre is trying like crazy to get um, research into disposal technologies. Uh, it's just a case of finding someone who's got the money. That's all, it's a case of resourcing. I'll give a little bit of an update there too. So MGA TMA, which is the Merchant, Merchant Grocers Association, Tim and Merchants Association. So the old TMA from Victoria, they're a national organisation now and they're doing a waste project. So they're, um, some of the information, as I said, in the 2020 sur uh, fabricators survey, that information we'll use to look at. So what, what MGA are trying to do is find a circular economy and work with the waste from all their supermarkets and, re um, and, and mix it for an agricultural point, point of view. I've spoken to Geoffrey from Sunshine University and Stephen Mitchell we've been working with. Borgs, um, which is one of FTMA's silver sponsors, Borgs um, have got an amazing, they've got a um, set up a new company called Redirect and they're collecting a lot of waste from fabricators in New South Wales um, and they're looking at expanding that. So they're taking that waste and taking it back to their Oberon plant and putting it back into the particle board. DNR Henderson did that as well with fabricators in um, Sydney at one stage and there are some fabricators in Victoria that take their waste to DNR Henderson's. And also we're working with the Hume City Council in Victoria um, that covers all the Northern Links shires. Um, I think there's um, 11 fabricators in that area. And we're looking at ways to again, work with Planet Arc and identify ways of finding a circular economy for the waste. Um, so there is a lot of work being done on it, um, but a lot more does need to be done from our industry. Yeah, yeah, we, need, we actually need a strategy. Uh, I'm sorry, it sounds public service-y, but we, we need to have a plan moving forward. Um, and as from what you're saying, there's a lot of work going on in the area, but is it coordinated, right? Is it? No, uh, no, it's uh, not. So for uh, example, when I had a call from, and when I had a call from Jeffrey up in um, the Sunshine University, and I said, have you spoken to Stephen Mitchell, um, who former Timber Development Association in New South Wales? I think Stephen's done more work on waste than most people in the industry. And, um, and, it's, it's just about everyone connecting and, and having, as you said, a yeah. united approach. Yeah. Yeah. We have another yeah. question here saying, H2 treatments, I believe, are often natural pyrethrums. Surely this is not toxic at all for end um, of life use. Is it just the government packages all treated timber together and treats it like CCA or bad? Right, okay. Snake venom is also natural. All right, um, so um, you know, marine stingers are also natural. It's all about chemicals. Now, unfortunately, the, the illusion is quite correct. Everyone just bundles it all together as being too hard and choose not to separate it. Um, the, um, the, the, theoretically, synthetic pyrethroids, uh, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're synthetic pyrethroids. They're not natural, they're synthetic. They're made from oil-based products. There's not enough poppies or, or plants or on, on the planet to make enough permethrin to fill all the PIBO cans that, that are out there. Um, the, um, yeah, there, there's, there, there needs to be a, it's getting back to the co coordinated effort in disposal. It's, getting, it's, it's completely getting back to that. Now, I, I know that when we try putting permethrin into glue lines for plywood, you probably lose about half of it because of the heat and the hydrolysis that goes on there. I can't see any reason why it couldn't be used for biofuel. I really can't. I think it'd be perf perfectly fine. No one's done the work. I know University of Queensland is currently, they're, they're ramping up their fire research people. Maybe there's an avenue there. And I know Jeff Morell's working with them as well um, to try and burn the stuff. Did that answer the question? Sorry? Well, well, yeah, it does. And, and I'd also say that, um, I had a fabricator once and um, I won't mention who it was. And I was doing a road trip and I walked into and I went, oh my God, that canara is pumping out the heat. And they took me out the back and they showed me and they were actually burning in a, a large biofuel to heat, heat the, um, their big warehouse. 
and they were burning treated timber. And I gave them a bit of a lecture and said, you know, here, get in trouble. And they said, no, no, we wait till it gets really, really hot before we put any heat, um, treated product on and therefore there's no discharge from the chimney. And I went, well, as long as you know that it's against the EPA rules and if you get caught, well, you'll get in trouble. So a, a day later, the um, apprentice went and stoked the fire and instead of starting it with all the red gum and getting it really hot before he put in the treated, he decided to start the fire with the treated timber. So it pumped black out of the chimney and the shire came knocking within half an hour. It is really important that we do tackle this. I think that um, burning it, they say that there's a slight increase in dioxins. Well, we need as an industry a report that shows that. And a lot of the timber companies, including um, Lonza and Copper joined me with the New South Wales government with EPA, a group called the Crucible, and they did a testing station up at um, Newcastle, I think it was, and they were burning all treated timber from Bay Timber. And they were burning it to treat it, but they just wanted, basically they wanted a shitload of money from industry for their research, even though they were already doing it and the industry at the time didn't put forward. But I do believe in a coordinated approach. And I think that FWPA is working with Jeffrey Morrell from up at Sunshine University. So hopefully we can find an answer there. I think, um, I think one of the, um, I know FPA, FWPA is taking money, and oh, sorry, I'm, I don't mean that negatively at all. FWPA is, it has part of FWPA funds is directed towards research, but ultimately it's our product. We have to pay for the research. We have to pay for that, for that information. So you have to be prepared to put your hand in your pocket to help pay for it. Um, I, I don't know how you do that because um, I, I, when I was doing research, oh, I stopped in 2012, I reckon 80%, 90% of my time was spent looking for money. Yep. You know, and 10% was doing research. So Jack, uh, we don't have another question at the moment, but I'd like to ask, how do we, so when, with the new um, standard now that it's in place, how does industry push for change? How do we push for industry best practice? So for example, as an industry, we can push that there is a certification program in place that everybody has to participate. I mean, if government's not going to um, push it as an issue, surely industry should be pushing it as best practice so we don't have cowboys out there um, in the industry. So how, how do we go about doing that? Okay. Firstly, one of the, one of the lines on one of my slides says, um, ask for analytical results, ask for testing of the product that you receive. All right, ask for certification that the product meets specification, whatever the specification may be. Secondly, and I know it's a problem with production, if you can't get what you need in terms of certification or properly treated product, don't buy it. Don't use it. You know, that's it. Knock it back. Send truckloads back. I, 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 that's a bit hard nosed, but you've only got to send one or two trucks back before people start getting. And the word goes around the industry very, very quickly. All right. Um, just because, you know, it, it, I, I understand it's, it's the commercial imperative. I understand that. Um, but the, <sighs> I have tried, as I said before, tried like crazy to get the industry to regulate. Um, as far as I'm concerned, well, the big boys do, the big fellas do, and, and they have great schemes in place. But the smaller guys, um, the, the cowboys, um, I would suggest calibrated guests. They're 20% of the production of treated um, timber in Australia, the, the smaller producers. Um, you know, the only way you're going to get to them is to, to, to make them toe the line in terms of analytical testing, certification and, um, and branding. And it's the users who have the power, not the producers. The users have got the checkbook in their back pocket. All right. And if they don't pay for the product, you know, that, that's the only way you're going to force the industry to do the right thing. I'm not suggesting for a minute that they're all cowboys. I'm not saying no, that. No. The trouble is, the trouble is, the, the one or two bad apples will just, it'll smear over the whole industry. It'll spread the whole industry. And FTMA Australia members can be very proud and, and, and feel, I suppose, um, confident that by using any one of our um, timber sponsors, like, you know, Hind and Timberlink and AKD and Dindus and Program Timber Supplies um, and Maya Timber, and, we're, and we've got others, if by any using any of ours, that you know that they are actually doing the right thing. And I also urge people that if you do have an issue, reach out, reach out to your association, whether it's Tabmark, 
T MGA TMA or FTMA, reach out so we can address it. We had one fabricator, a worker actually started a blog because he was getting um, a rash from his uh, from the treated and he went to pick his child up from school and the child got a rash. So he started this blog about, can I get cancer from this treatment? What's it doing? And we put a stop to it straight away to explain that no. And in the end, we did explore it. They were getting their timber from another uh, a non-FTMA sponsor, uh, timber sponsor and or member. And they were doing a bad treatment job and they had to change their process, which they did. And that only happened because we addressed it. So I do urge everyone to reach out and ask. Um, I have got a question here saying, isn't it up to TPAA to police and call out the cowboy treaters? Uh, we have no authority to do that. We have absolutely no authority to do that at all. Um, we, um, uh, uh, policing is, you know, policing is a legal requirement, as far as I, I can tell. Um, and um, essentially what we do, a TPAA, is we maintain the list of treatment plants. We go to bat for the industry, um, but we've got no hold over the members. No hold. Um, um, and I mean, you guys, FTMA, are a great model, and I'd love to be more like you guys. But we, we just don't have that power or authority. I'd love to be able to do it, but they can tell us to get stuffed, and there's nothing we can do about it. Hey, lots of people tell me to get stuffed and I really can't do it either, but I do. <laughs> so, uh, look, Jack, um, you're always an absolutely entertaining and um, knowledgeable presenter and we truly thank TPAA for their, um, for their time today. Kirsten, any questions? Any questions? You know, alluding back to what you're saying before, talk to us. Talk to us. You know, there's a lot of knowledge and information out there and, and if you've got any problems, give us a hoy um, and, and we'll try and help. Wonderful. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's fine. Well, thank you very much, Jack. Um, truly a pleasure having you on here today. And um, next week we have, who is it again? Oh, we've got Dave Gover from Engineer Wood Products. And the chain of custody he's talking about next week, actually some of the information that um, Jack pointed out today will be covered next week because it is important for fabricators, it's important, important for timber merchants um, that you do have that chain of custody. And in the past, we couldn't actually have any program because we would use, you know, one, one job could go out with three timber, three different lots of uh, timber in it. So Dave's gonna show us how we can do that because that really helps um, businesses when they're going for corporate jobs um, or government jobs, that you have everything in place. So please everyone, if you haven't registered, um, please go and register via the web FTMA website and we will send a link out next Monday like we do every Monday to all of our members and to those that have registered specifically for the webinars. So thank you once again, Jack. Um, I hope your wife cleans okay. up her office at some stage and, um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, have a good day, everybody. Thanks for okay. joining us. Bye. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye.